tonight we're getting on a train. And lately, beloved online celebrity Colleen Ballinger's true nature has come to light. Colleen Ballinger recently has been again exposed by multiple fans for her incredibly inappropriate interactions with countless amounts of super fans. This was like 2017, 2016, so I would have been... 15 or something like that. The entire carefully curated house of cards she built for herself has begun crumbling. Adam, you need questions for your Q&A? Are you a Countless allegations of distributing porn to minors. Absolutely breaks my heart to see people saying negative things about me interacting with my fans based on this situation. They did viewing parties of my adult content to make fun of me. The inappropriate and private conversations with minors without their parents' knowledge. Then I received a message from this person's mother asking me to not speak his name. So I was trying to respect the mother's wishes and the parents' wishes of this 17-year-old. Around this time though was whenever my parents started getting a little bit more cautious and were wondering why a 30-year-old was talking to, at this time, a 13-year-old about her divorce. The exploitation of free labor from her fans, the glorification of underage bodies. Because Colleen became this rich off of the devotion of her child fans, YouTubers with child audiences carry so much power and even more responsibility. Fuck me, right? Hold people accountable! Or yourself. Two thousand eight was a weird time. The Motorola Razor was the most popular cell phone in use within the U.S. The first iteration of the iPhone was only six months old, and Blackberries were still kind of cool. Uh, uh, no way. Jesse McCartney was still a name that people had heard of or talked about. Teens across the world cried into their journals while listening to Viva La Vida by Coldplay, which was the only song in existence that year. Disney hadn't yet bought Marvel, and we had one. Count it. One Iron Man movie, not these extensive superhero cinematic universes, and Netflix could send you DVDs in the mail, rather than you having to drive out to Blockbuster. I got my first cell phone that year, it was a flip phone with an antenna, and I still wouldn't be able to send text messages for less than six cents apiece for another three years. The fuzzy monkey-shaped wallet I got from Claire's always had at least two gift cards to Borders Bookstore inside of it. I still flat ironed my bangs, I bought all my jewelry at Hot Topic, and I used the phrase not like other girls unironically. Actually, ironic humor wouldn't take off for about another year or so. 2008 was all about random humor. May I recommend the Sprite? <laughs> which we'll get into in this video. Stealing your pickup line straight from lolcat memes was considered extremely hot. Asking if I can has cheeseburger was a legitimate way of asking someone to go on a date with you. But that's all to say that 2008 was, to say the least, a bit of a different time. It was also the year that a 21-year-old vocal performance major named Colleen Ballinger created a YouTube channel and a character that would soon go viral. Miranda Sings was a YouTube channel that began back in 2008 and somehow managed to stay relevant all the way into 2023, amassing over 10 million subscribers, sending Colleen on regular tours to perform live shows throughout the world. As of early 2023, just a few weeks before I filmed this video, Colleen was still going on tours, performing live as Miranda and uploading new videos to the Miranda Sings YouTube channel. And over these past 15 years, yes, 2008 was 15 years ago, pop culture and social discourse has changed quite a lot, and so has Colleen Ballinger. Once a beloved, goofy parody character created for grainy, standard definition, 4x3 aspect ratio YouTube videos, Miranda Sings grew to eventually gain her own Netflix show, write two best-selling books, and build her own boss babe empire. It wasn't until 2020 that Colleen ended up in her first big scandal, when a former fan named Adam McIntyre, then 17 years Years old at the time, released a video called Colleen Ballinger Stop Lying, in which he alleged that Colleen had sent him lingerie in the mail when he was only 13 years old, plus had used his unpaid labor as a social media intern for years, all while breaking her promises to eventually hire him for pay. And then on the 26th of March, at 12 minutes past 10 p.m., she messaged me and said, I have a present for you today. I've never done this with anyone, but I'm trusting you. And then she proceeded to tell me about how she was planning on making me her social media intern. Right now, I'm considering you my social media intern, but if things go well, we can talk about me hiring you part-time for an hourly rate. I was so excited. I felt like I had a job. And there were so many conversations on Snapchat where she told me that once I got out of college, that this was going to be my job. And 
I was very delusional to think that I was going to have that. And I was very delusional to think that I was going to get income for this. And I was very delusional to think that she cared about my ideas at all because I never got credit. Was it possible that Colleen Ballinger was using her Miranda character to attract kids, then exploit them for her own fame and profit? Well, Colleen also made a video that year responding to Adam's allegations, claiming that everything he'd said was out of context. Anyone who heard this out of context and was offended, I completely understand because I would be too. But in this situation, context is everything. Things. It was never a sneaky, creepy, gross thing that I was doing in secret. It was a silly, stupid mistake that now is being blown way out of proportion. He did have access to my Miranda Sings Twitter account for one day, um, not for years. I loved asking my fans for advice on what I should post for Miranda videos, Miranda tweets, things like that. I've taken a handful of suggestions as to what I should tweet as Miranda from my fans over the years, and he's included in that. Most fans took Colleen's side, and not wanting to receive any more harassment for speaking out, Adam stayed mostly quiet on the issue until just a few months ago when he released two new videos. I was right about Colleen Ballinger and my relationship with Colleen Ballinger, in which he showed proof that everything he'd said was not only true, but was actually worse than we originally thought. Colleen had not only been using her underage fans as a way to get free labor, but she'd also been engaging them in very inappropriate and often sexual conversations. She was literally in DMs talking to children about SEX. I would have been 15. This time, this was 2016, I think I was 14, 14-ish. I write, my ass looks good today, y'all. Colleen comes into the chat, after not responding to anything else, and goes, pics, Adam. I was 15, 14, 15, and Colleen, um, I wrote that I was having a Q&A, a YouTube Q&A, and Colleen Ballinger, the 31-year-old, comments and goes, Adam, you need questions for your Q&A? Are you a virgin? And then furthermore, goes on and says, what's your favorite sexual position. After this all came out, many former viewers of Colleen's work went back through her catalog to see if the signs were there. And as it turns out, a lot of them were. Today's video is going to dive deep into all of that and through two particular lenses. As this channel is Savvy Writes Books and I'm here to talk about books and business, we're going to examine Colleen Ballinger as an author and as a businesswoman. How did Colleen build her brand? What was it that caused her brand to then crumble? Through an extensive and detailed review of Colleen's two books, we'll look at the ways that Colleen identified her target audience, pandered to and exploited that audience, and how she finally started to wake the public up to how a child predator might look. It's not always a man in a trench coat, it's not always stranger danger, and it's especially not the LGBTQ community like demons like Ron DeSantis would have you believe. Sometimes a groomer takes the form of a conventionally attractive cisgender woman, a mother of three children, a comedic actress, and a singer that parents thought they could trust. Most of all, today we're going to talk about what we can learn from Colleen Ballinger. What does this situation mean for the ways that we analyze literature, the ways we identify our own target audiences and customers, and the ways that we eventually protect ourselves? What can Colleen Ballinger teach us about how not to run a business? All that and more coming up in just a moment. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. What's up my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy, welcome back to Savvy Writes Books. This is the channel where we talk about books and business. If you're new here, please don't forget to take a minute and hit the subscribe button. I put out new videos every week, diving deep into book reviews, analyzing literature, talking about business commentary, and looking at all of those types of things. So if any of that interests you, go ahead and subscribe and don't forget to ring the notification bell. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to everyone who supports this channel on Patreon. Patreon supporters' names are up on the screen. Take a look in the description below where you can see Patreon supporters who contribute $5 a month and up because the reward for that tier is for me to promote your own links and things like that in my description below. Recently, my Patreon page has had a ton of extra bonus content. I've been putting out blog posts showing behind the scenes of my life as a writer and a business owner and the stuff I've been doing there. I've also been uh, doing weekly Patreon exclusive live streams where we hang out, react to popular videos, things like that. So if any of that interests you, check out Patreon as well. And one more thing before we continue with today's topic, and that is that I must give a quick shout out to our sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning platform that offers classes and tutorials about a wide variety of topics. From their well-known classes in photography, film and video editing, art and illustration, and other creative fields, to their classes on personal, professional, and career development, Skillshare is a platform that's made for creative entrepreneurs like me, and maybe someone like you too. 
Sometimes I get questions from viewers asking how to get started on YouTube, how to get comfortable in front of the camera, film that first video, and learn basic editing skills. The truth is there's no one simple straightforward path to this, but one thing I love about Skillshare is that you can learn these things from a variety of video creators and practice what works best for you. For example, big name YouTuber Lily Singh currently has a class available on Skillshare called Social Media Success Video Storytelling on YouTube and Beyond, where she takes you through the process of creating video ideas, scripting your videos, and then filming and editing your videos as well, all filled with her personal experiences of what worked for her as she began building her own YouTube career. I love that Skillshare focuses on starting small with your goals and learning a little bit more every day. Like I've said countless times before on this channel, building good habits comes from small bits of consistency. If you're interested in trying Skillshare for yourself, take a look in my description below where I have a link that you can click on to go ahead and give it a try. The first 1,000 people who click this link will receive a one-month free trial of Skillshare. I hope you enjoy learning some new skills and continuing to develop your passions. Thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Now back to our main topic. Who is Miranda Sings? I first encountered Colleen Ballinger probably around 2009 or so when some of my friends were circulating her early video called Free Voice Lesson. In this video, Miranda, a snooty, pretentious, aspiring singer, gives the audience a free voice lesson, which she reminds us over and over again is worth a lot of money, all while giving us terrible actual singing advice. I'm going to give you a free voice lesson, and usually they cost a lot of money. In warm-ups, you have to sing a scale. Scale is something, it's on a piano. I usually warm up about two hours or so before I make a video for you guys. We have the high voice and a low voice, soprano and alto voices. I sing both. Not everyone can sing, but most people can only sing one. How you're supposed to do is you can shake your chin or your head or your body, something, shake something, and usually it'll shake your voice. A lot of Colleen's early videos look like this. Grainy, standard definition, 4x3 aspect ratio, bad audio quality, true parody. In these videos, Colleen is committing fully to the Miranda bit, and Miranda as a character is mostly grounded in reality. But you, baby, I got it. What you need. You know I got it. In fact, many people, and not just children, but teens and adults as well, weren't sure at first if Miranda was a real person or if she was just someone doing a bit. And I'll admit something to you guys. In these early Miranda Sings videos, these shitty, low-quality productions in which Colleen straddles the line between ridiculousness and realism, I actually found these hilarious. This was probably because back when I was in high school, pretty much all of my friends were musical theater kids except me, because I can't sing to save my life. Instead, I played the saxophone, also not particularly well, because remember, I'm not like other girls. See, Miranda Sings was originally intended to be a parody of her fellow voice and singing majors who had a little bit too big of an ego. Colleen's early performances were much more subtle, and while viewers today can probably immediately tell she's playing a character, audiences in 2008, when the internet was a lot more insane than it is now, when cringe content and cringe compilations were king, could easily see her as potentially just a really egotistical person rather than a fictional character. The early versions of Miranda Sings remind me a lot of the social media parody accounts that grew from parody and groups that I'm a part of, which I also tend to find hilarious. As you guys know, I'm a writer, I have a master's degree in English, I'm an undergrad, I was a film major, so basically I'm just an annoying ass hipster all the time. Early Miranda Sings was to musical theater kids what a Twitter account like Guy in Your MFA was to me as a writer. Someone who brags about having one piece published in the New Yorker, someone who never stops starting sentences with as a published author, the guy who wears a scarf and a fedora and carries around a to-go latte no matter what the weather's like outside, all while he explains his concept for the great American novel, which always involves white men having a midlife crisis while smoking cigarettes and complaining to a bartender about their traumatic past. All of this is parody, and I love it. And today we're going to go into where exactly that line is between parody as an art form and obnoxious content as bullying when we get into Colleen's books in just a bit. But all of that is to say that Miranda Sings began as a parody, but evolved into something 
something else entirely. Something that didn't really appeal to high school kids or college freshmen who were tired of their friends breaking into Les Mis songs in the middle of the cafeteria, or MFA students surrounded by cigarette smoke in a 21st century writing workshop whose building had outlawed smoking 20 years ago. Instead, as the character evolved, so did Colleen's audience. As her character became further removed from reality, her audience became much younger. Nowadays, Miranda Sings is pretty much unrecognizable from her origins. She's obnoxious, she's excessive, she pronounces half the words she says wrong, and she has this weird extensive backstory about her childhood of abusing animals, eating gross things like bodily waste, and being physically exploited by her creepy uncle. Basically, Miranda went from a true parody character to another obnoxious internet clown, there for the gross-out humor that was popular of the time. That's good. Uh, Whoa. Watch out! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Miranda Sings now appeals to a much younger audience, often those in the 9 to 16 year old age range. Yet even though Colleen's audience has been getting younger, her humor has only been getting raunchier. With some of her longest running bits being jokes about the fluids that come out of vaginas, the weird things her creepy uncle does when he takes photos of her, and of course, her yelling the P word. I'm not gonna say the word because it might still be too early in the YouTube video for that. The word that means explicit adult imagery. Yelling that as loud as she can at the top of her lungs at everything. Now we we are going to delve into the nuances of these types of humor in a bit when we get into reviewing Miranda's books. Remember, just because a joke is gross or raunchy doesn't mean it's a bad joke or that it fails as humor. It all depends on the setup, the delivery, the execution, and most of all, the target audience. Actually, knowing your target audience is probably the number one most important thing for any business owner. And as we know, content creators are entrepreneurs in their own way. Miranda Sings as a brand has brought in millions of dollars with Colleen Ballinger now at acting as the head of the Miranda Sings company as she makes money through her boss babe empire of YouTube ad revenue, live show tickets, merch sales, book sales, and more. And I think that's where our discussion of Colleen's downfall will begin, with an examination of Colleen as a businesswoman. Once Colleen started having children, she started posting more on her Colleen Ballinger channel and her vlogging channel. Oh. You want a banana? Oh, and branded herself as more of a mommy vlogger. She goes, I can't keep up with being a mom and running all my social medias and my YouTube channels um, to waste your interactions on social media with just posting thumbnails. Well, she goes, well then help me. I was so excited. I felt like I had a job. She told me that once I got out of college that this was going to be my job. Never got credit. Most content creators start out as a sole proprietor of sorts. Actually, many creative small business owners start that way. Make everything you can yourself until you can afford to hire someone who does it better and faster than you can. That's how I started my YouTube channel. For the first three years I was on this platform, I did everything myself. Scripting, filming, editing, my own spreadsheets, my own finances, all of that stuff. But as my channel grew, so did the scope of my videos and so did my income. I was then able to use that income to hire an editor and hire a manager so that I could focus on this part of my work. Scripting the video videos, talking to the camera, researching the topics, and then, of course, writing my books, doing my art, all of that type of stuff. That is a pretty normal trajectory for a content creator or any creative entrepreneur, and Colleen is no different in this aspect. As Colleen's channel grew, so did her team. Colleen herself has even mentioned that she enjoys hiring her fans. This wouldn't be the first time I'd hired a fan. I love hiring my fans for many reasons. I've hired my fans to design merch, I've hired fans to go on tour with me, I've hired fans to edit things for me, and how hiring my employees works is I usually do a little test run to see how it goes. If it goes well, then I hire them officially through my company and they are paid legally through the corporation. It was no different for him. I wanted to do a little test run. If it went well, then I wanted to hire him. And I agree. There's nothing wrong with this. Assuming two things. One, that the fans you hire are adults and two, that you pay them. Unfortunately, it seems that none of this was the case when it came to Colleen's former social media manager, Adam McIntyre, who ran Colleen's social media when he was a minor and according to him, didn't receive any payment or any credit for the work that he did. Now, in Colleen's video addressing everything from 2020, she claimed that Adam hadn't been working for her for years like he said. Rather, he was just doing a test run of her social media for one day and the test run didn't work out. She also claims that he was the one to frequently request that he work on her social media for free rather than Colleen having been the one to reach out to him asking for help. And since then, he's asked me multiple times if he can help me out with social media again. I always thought that was really, really sweet, but most of the time I did not engage in those conversations until recently. A couple months ago, he reached out to me and brought up the fact that the Miranda accounts hadn't been as active as they used to be and how he 
wanted to help me do more social media stuff. So he sent me a whole bunch of edited photos that he had in a folder ready to go for Miranda. He told me about a bunch of funny tweets he wanted to post, and he let me know that he had experience working in social media. He really betted for himself. However, Adam's new video, My Relationship with Colleen Ballinger, posted last month, shares his side of the story, including proof that not only had he been creating content for Colleen for years, not one day like she'd have us believe, but that he'd also done so for free. There you have it, confirmed that I was doing this since 2017 for her. So from the years 2017, 2018, 2019 was whenever I would give Colleen ideas like over Snapchat or over Twitter or something like that. March 25th, 2020, I say, I want you to know I spend um, so much of this having to edit these cringe edits for Miranda's Twitter. So here I sent one of iCarly, here I sent Michael Jackson, like it was just, you know, stupid stuff. Here we have Colleen and Miranda as Kim and Taylor. Um, I just have like a face chin picture of Miranda because she would post all of these like ugly photos of Miranda so she would get me to edit them. I never, never, never got credit. It was all promised that if it went well, I would get the job. She goes on to say in a couple messages that that's what's gonna happen, but over Snapchat for the years prior, she said that was gonna happen and it never did. But it just felt like just like dangling it over me. And of course I was like, oh my God, the end goal is I'm going to work for my favorite YouTuber, my best friend. Basically, she just got hundreds of ideas from me and used many of them and I just never got anything for it. This video also showed proof that Colleen's claim that Adam had been offering his free services and that she didn't engage, that was false. She goes, I can't keep up with being a mom and running all my social medias and my YouTube channel, so I have to pick one and I enjoy me more than Miranda, so I always pick that one. And I go, but your series is so good, she was doing a Miranda Sing series at the time, um, to waste your interactions on social media with just posting thumbnails. Well, she goes, well then help me. So here again, she never likes to confirm that she literally kept coming to me for things. Here she's going help me. And then prior we confirmed that I was doing it for years anyway. By the way, she has said that none of this happened. And then she goes, I love all that. I don't know uh, what now, how do we do this? I remember there was, we did like a Snapchat call or something like that where she was like, I'm giving up on it. She was like, I just need you to help. And I mean, literally her messaging help me. And I go, well, how do you want to do this? Um, all right, she goes, haha, I was born in, she's basically making a joke that she's old and I go granny. Um, I don't know how I want to do this because I've never done it before. What were you thinking? His messages clearly show Colleen asking him for help after he pitched his work. And by the way, just because someone pitches their work to you doesn't mean you have to take it for free. I've had people pitch me work before, and if I can pay them to work for me, I might if it's a good fit, and if I can't budget for it at the time, then I don't. There was no reason that Colleen had to promise Adam a job in the future, hire him in this intern role, and then take his work without payment or credit. The purpose of an internship is education, and in an un paid internship especially, or any internship paying below minimum wage or below market rate, the goal needs to be on the job training, tactile education, rather than providing labor or value to the company. Because if you're providing financial value to the company, they owe you compensation. In their 2021 article, more than 40% of interns are still unpaid, CNBC reported, unpaid internships can be a controversial topic. Some argue they provide valuable exposure for young people trying to learn about an industry, while others critique the practice as an excuse to exploit free labor from young workers eager to get a foot in the door. The Fair Labor Standards Act, originally passed in 1938, requires for-profit employers and non-profit employers that generate $500,000 or more in business annually to pay employees for their work. This act was soon impacted by the 1947 Supreme Court case Walling versus Portland Terminal Company. At the time, the Portland Terminal Company offered an unpaid program for aspiring railroad brakemen that lasted for seven or eight days. When trainees sued the company hoping to get paid, the case made it to the Supreme Court, which ultimately found participants did not need to be paid because they were trainees rather than employees based on the court's finding that the trainee's work does not expedite the railroad's business, but may, and sometimes does, actually impede it. This decision created a long-lasting precedent for the conditions under which it is legal for employers to not pay trainees and interns. Essentially, an organization does not need to pay an intern under the argument that the intern is receiving more benefit from the relationship than the organization. <laughs> so the question here is, did Adam receive more benefit from his work as social media manager than Colleen did? Was the purpose of him providing Colleen with free content for him to learn about social media analysts to study under her to gain new photo editing skills or anything like that. No. As Adam's messages with Colleen clearly show, he was the one who had the expertise surrounding social media. He was the one who edited the photos on his own. He was the one advising her about what to do well within the algorithms. He was the one staying up to date on pop culture and changing social media trends. She even gave him access to her account just to post whatever he thought was best without her providing any guidance or education. This means that Adam was not studying under Colleen. He was working 
for her. He was providing her with material that he created, material that she profited from, and because of that, ethically, he should have been paid. And I want to be clear, I don't think I'm a perfect person or that my hands are entirely clean or that any of our hands are entirely clean when it comes to the mess of unpaid internships as a concept. I personally hate unpaid internships and I think they should be illegal or at least they really need to be regulated better than they are. As it stands, companies are just hiring unpaid interns left and right, there isn't a lot of oversight. Companies should first have to prove that the position they have is training, not labor, and I know that nobody ever enforces this. That's all to say that unpaid internships are just extremely exploitative of young people. And like I've said, I'm not clean here. I've worked for many companies that have had unpaid interns. I've been an unpaid intern myself back in college. When I was in grad school, I had business school professors advise me to try hiring unpaid interns to help me with social media when I was first starting a business. I never ended up actually doing that, but I just tell that story as a way to show how ingrained this practice is within American culture. So when it comes to unpaid labor, I am extremely disappointed in Colleen. We are all indoctrinated with these ideals of American capitalism basically from birth, and a lot of people look at unpaid internships as just the way that things are done, as dues you have to pay to make it in highly competitive and often creative industries. That's wrong. And it's also a much bigger problem than Colleen's involvement might indicate. Plus, we also need to keep in mind that it's not like Colleen was just some new creator starting out who reached out to a friend for help before she could actually afford to hire anyone. At the time Adam was working for Colleen, she was already a huge name on YouTube. Southwest Journal estimates that Colleen is worth about $12 million and that she earns approximately $5 million every year. Colleen Ballinger is a millionaire. There's absolutely no reason she couldn't pay everybody for their work. So we need to get rid of the unpaid internship industry, we need to bring back apprenticeships and paid training, but for now we are going to put a pin in the unpaid social media intern discussion. Regardless of your thoughts on unpaid internships or teenagers working or the invisible hand of Adam Smith pushing us all to our deaths one by one, there's another issue at play here, and that's that Miranda Sings wasn't even the only way Colleen Ballinger was making money. Miranda Sings wasn't even Colleen's only channel. In the true nature of someone who is prone to exploiting children, Colleen was also running a family vlog. <laughs> That's a book. It's a little. It's a little piece of paper. <laughs> These are like rainbow cloud bath bombs. Ooh, you want a banana? Yes. If you've seen my videos before, I am sure you know how I feel about family vlogs. Get rid of them, burn them all to the ground. In my video about the fathering autism vlog on this channel, as well as my video about the Duggar family and 19 kids and counting, I've talked before about how I don't believe that children should have their private lives publicized for an audience, whether that's through reality TV, family vlogging, or having influencer parents. In addition to Colleen Vlogs, the channel where Colleen regularly uploads videos of her baby and toddler aged children, Colleen's brother Chris has a family vlog as well called Ballinger Family, where he and his wife vlog their entire family life. When we reviewed the documentary Shiny Happy People on this channel a few weeks ago, I talked in depth about how one of the reasons I'm so against having children on reality TV and in family vlogs is because those children don't have the same legal protections that most child actors in Hollywood have. And we know how abusive Hollywood is to children. And the family vlogging and reality TV industries have less protection for kids. Kids who grow up in family vlogs deal with their private lives, their real lives. Lives, not a fictitious character, being put into the spotlight before they're even old enough to talk, let alone consent. The family vlogging world is rife with parents refusing to share profits with their kids or pay them for their work, along with a lack of laws to enforce that kids are compensated for the wealth that they generate for their parents. So that's all to say, if you're a family vlogger, you're a bad person. That's it. I'm sorry. I don't make the rules. But savvy, you might be saying. This section of the video went into the ways that Colleen made money off of kids, whether that was through having underage fans work for her as unpaid in turns or filming her children for a family vlog, but does Colleen's content itself actually harm children? Because a lot of other amazing YouTubers have already covered the ways that Colleen's live show performances and vlog content have made kids uncomfortable, today I'm going to focus on a different piece of Colleen's empire. Because this channel is Savvy Writes Books, and because I'm that annoying hipster bitch with a master's degree in English who starts every sentence with as a published author and has my coffee and I I'm not smoking cigarettes in my house, that would be disgusting. But because of that, you know what we're gonna review today, and that is the Miranda Sings books. Colleen has written two books as Miranda. It was published by Simon and Schuster Children. 
This waste of paper was published by Simon and Schuster Children's. With all these allegations against her, this book really, really isn't doing her any favours. I guess it's one thing to joke about things, but it's another if you start getting accused of the things that you were previously joking about. Colleen Ballinger has written two books as her character Miranda Sings. First, Self Health, published in 2015, and second, My Diary, published in 2018. According to two other YouTubers who have read these books, two creators that I absolutely love and highly recommend, Rachel Oates and Alizi, these books were published by Simon & Schuster's Children's Division. Now, I couldn't find proof of that when I looked at it, even though both of them showed proof, and that's when it hit me. Rachel and Alizi are both British, and they're both on the UK version of Amazon, so it seems that at the very least, the UK edition, the UK imprint of Simon & Schuster, published this book through Simon and Schuster kids. A couple years ago, I made a video about Simon & Schuster and why it is, in my opinion, the worst of the big five publishing houses. Simon & Schuster is responsible for Jake Paul's misogynistic mess of a memoir, for Gabby Hanna's poetry, and for the one self-help book that is the bane of my bisexual existence, The Straight Girl's Guide to Sleeping with Chicks by Jen Sincero. Watch my review on it if you haven't already. It's real and it's even worse than it sounds if you can believe that. So this is all to say that, yeah, of course Simon & Schuster published the Miranda Sings books. They almost always publish the influencer books that are going to rake in the cash regardless of the quality. While the UK editions of these books are listed as being published by the Children's Division, in the US the publisher is listed as Gallery Books, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster, but is a division that makes books for adults as well. And this is leading into a big question, which is going to be the basic framing of this whole section of the video. Who are these books? For. Are they for young kids in elementary school? Are they for teens? For adults? Who are they for? And I don't think there's just one simple answer to that, and we'll delve into why in just a moment. Regardless of whether the publisher specialized in kids' books or not, at the end of the day, a lot of kids were the ones reading the books. Here's a brief sampling of Amazon reviews I found from parents. Miranda fans will like this book. My preteen daughter wanted it, knocking off one star since some of the content is geared for more mature readers. Bought this for my 10 year old daughter who adores Miranda Sings and watches her on YouTube. For the most part, the book is pretty lighthearted, but I found a few questionable things that I didn't necessarily find appropriate for my 10 year old, such as a female who wears pumps is a slut. I can take a joke, I consider myself to be quite humorous, but not sure a child can tell sarcasm in the pages of a book. I'd read it before giving it to your child. This is definitely not for kids. It's even iffy for teenagers. I'm sure older teens would enjoy this fun-filled picture book, but it's not for kids. My eight year old is a huge fan for some reason and I decided to get it for her, but I skimmed through it before giving it to her and ultimately I had to return it. Again, it's all in good fun, but not for kids. It references a lot of teenage, young college girl situations such as sex, porn, how to pick up boys, different types of things like flings, boyfriends, one night stands, also has a, a section that suggests porn jokingly, etc. Colleen has access to her own YouTube analytics. She can see the age ranges that her audience tends to fall into. And to be clear, I think suggesting or adult humor in children's content can work in some situations. For example, some of the most iconic raunchy jokes I saw as a child came from the family-friendly show Animaniacs. A giant pants dispenser. Problem? Please. Stop playing with my bust! I am Ludwig von Beethoven, world-famous composer and pianist. You're a what? A pianist! Good night, everybody! I found proof! No, 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 fingerprints! And these moments were hilarious. Similarly, look at the Shrek franchise. The movies appeal to all ages because the plots are simple enough for kids to follow, but they also include some more mature jokes. Although she lives with seven other men, she's not easy. That must be Lord Farquaad's castle. Uh -huh, that's the place. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> now, I grew up sitting my ass in front of the TV watching Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon was the home of my favorite roulette game, Kids Show or Stoner Show. We had shows like Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life, which mixed simple slapstick humor with jokes that would also go over kids' heads. And that's one reason that these shows are the ones adults in their 30s are now returning to, re-watching when they're stoned off their ass because the show hits different now. However, there is a difference between this type of humor and the humor we're about to look at in 
in Colleen's books. Yes, children's content can contain inappropriate humor, and often it does well when it does, but that humor has to have enough plausible deniability, meaning the joke has to work without the sexual or violent element as well. For example, look at the joke in Shrek about how Lord Farquaad is compensating for something with his castle size. As adults, we can watch that and know that it's a joke about his dick size. However, a kid watching that would believe that the joke is about the fact that Lord Farquaad is short. The joke works even when the sexual element is removed. Look at my favorite Animaniacs clip, the one about fingerprints. The joke is obviously filthy. Finger prince. But the joke works without the innuendo as well. She was supposed to find P-R-I-N-T-S and instead found P-R-I-N-C-E. The pun is still there even when the sexual component of the joke goes over the child's head. And because of that, these shows appeal to kids despite their raunchy humor, not because of it. And that's the difference when it comes to Colleen's work versus these beloved animated shows and movies. As we'll see when we look through these books in a moment, without the explicit sexual and violent imagery in the Miranda Sings books, there isn't really any joke left. If you remove that element, there's no other pun to fall back on. Now, this isn't true for every joke she makes in the books, so I think it's important that we approach the analyzing of humor in this situation with some nuance. The last thing I ever want to do is be the joke police. I'm someone who finds pretty much everything funny, so we're going to have to look at each joke both in a vacuum and within the wider context of Colleen's overall body of work. We also need to keep in mind that even if Miranda Sings started off as a PG-13 character like Colleen claims, once she she began getting books published by Simon & Schuster's Children's Division and performing to audiences that she knew were prepubescent, she should have been capable of either adapting her work or funneling that work into a different demographic. It is possible to adapt your work for a new audience. Let's take a look at another YouTuber from the same era as Miranda Sings, one who was also wildly popular in 2008, and that is Fred! 15 years ago, Fred, a channel run by the YouTuber Lucas Cruikshank, was the most popular channel on the platform gathering tens of millions of views per video. With his high-pitched chipmunk voice and his obnoxious behavior, Fred obviously became popular with younger demographics, which led Nickelodeon to adapting Fred into a series of three movies targeted at young demographics. However, what a lot of people don't remember is, before Fred became mainstream, Fred was extremely inappropriate for kids. Here are some examples. Fred, I'm home, and I'm really drunk. Okay, Mom. Today my mom, well I mean last time my mom was at a big huge party thing and she drank a lot of alcohol. So yeah, she has a really big hangover today. So yeah, I snuck out of the house and went to our community park, it's pretty fun. Hey, it's Fred, I'm kind of worried right now. Because you know how my mom was at the bar last week when I was with Bertha? Well, she hasn't came back yet. Bye bye, medication! character was adapted for the Nickelodeon movies, which would be broadcast on a TV station that reached elementary school aged kids, they removed a lot of these types of jokes. Fred's mom was still a little bit out there, but she wasn't locking him in dog crates for three days, coming home hungover every morning, or flying around the world to have sex with wanted criminals. She was just a weird lady. And that's because without another element to those jokes, the joke is solely the shock value. And that's fine, but it's not for kids. So now on to our next question. Are the Miranda Sings books for kids. One argument I have seen regarding Colleen's writing within the Miranda Sings books is that they obviously have a child audience because the writing style, the type of simplistic humor, and the visual themes of the book would never appeal to teens or adults. I actually really disagree with this point, but I also see where people are coming from, which is why, again, we need some nuance here. I started this video off by discussing the year 2008 and how it was a very different era, and that is true especially when we look at the types of humor that were popular at the time. While irony and then later post irony were the main types of humor that permeated the 2010s and then the early 2020s, the decade of the 2000s, especially the end of that decade, like 2008, 2009, those years were filled with random humor. These jokes are not going to translate well today, but 15 years ago, talking in a high-pitched voice, intentionally mispronouncing random words, and shouting non sequiturs were considered the peak of comedy. If you're any more than one year younger than me, you probably need to show you what I mean here. There's this account I love on Instagram right now called Riri Bibby, who posts fantastic fantastic Instagram reels parodying the random girls of 15 years ago. Excuse me, Charles, Mountain Dew makes with Dr. Pepper. Thank you. I have important and serious news. I am now with child. This is your son. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Start calling Lombardy Tongues, just like you. This is my son, Shane Ludwig. Wondering. 
and her pizza not make nervous as well because you breathe air and I breathe air and so I thought you might want to grab your pizza. So that was me in high school. Like literally. I had that exact Dr. Pepper shirt. I wore it almost every day. I unironically flirted by saying I can has hug to guys and it worked but that could have also been because my boobs were really huge back then. But that's all to say that yes teens once did like this type of humor even if nowadays it looks completely stupid. So what is the point of all of this? Well the Miranda Sings books tie these things together. The random humor of the late 2000s, the gross out humor popular with kids and teens in the early 2000s, and the adult jokes and aimed at a younger audience that we saw in the 90s. Now, do these books do all of that particularly well? No. And that's where the issue comes in. We do need to keep a few things in mind moving forward. Colleen's books were not published in 2008. That's when her character began. These books were published in 2015 and 2018, long after random humor to this extent had long gone out of style. I only bring up that point to explain that, yes, early Miranda Sings work did have an appeal to older audiences, and the humor in these books is absolutely in line with with what quirky or nerdy teens would be laughing at in 2008. So I do think there does exist some universe where Colleen may have truly believed that these books would reach a PG-13 audience. At the same time, operating solely on that belief was extremely irresponsible of Colleen. After all, she'd been performing for an audience that grew younger and younger, and the books didn't include any type of PG-13 rating like we'd see on movies, or a parental advisory sticker like we'd see on a music album. Maybe this book should have said 13 and up or something, so somewhere on it because after reading these books I can assure you they are not appropriate for young children. All I'm saying is that these books would have had potential to appeal to millennials who grew up with the random humor type of thing as teens as that is 1000% the style that these books utilize. So with all of that background information in mind let's delve into Colleen's first book, Self Health. Again because I am literally the easiest person in the world to make laugh I found the title hilarious, Self Health. <laughs> when I'm not like here talking to the camera when I'm just like talking out loud at my home Half the time I just mix around letters and words for fun. That's my type of humor. Self Health is a parody of a self-help book and contrary to what some people are saying, I do think that a self-help book parody can appeal to a wide range of audiences. Back when I was in fifth grade, I used to love writing my own self-help book parodies that would just give out terrible advice. That is something that kids and teens find funny. If you're not well versed in parody, satire, and pastiche as literary devices, I highly recommend you check out the video Rachel Oates posted about a year ago about the history of parody and its impact impact socially as an art form. So let's begin by looking back at the history of parody. Most people trace it back at least all the way to ancient Greece. Aristotle was one of the first people to use the phrase parodia in his work Poetics. I would argue that when you boil it down to its most simple form, parody is about critiquing work in an entertaining way that makes it super accessible to everyone. Even as an adult, I've written my own parody self-help books. I have one that I've posted on my Patreon and that I've also sold on Amazon. It's called Bro Stop Licking Your Balls and it's a self-help book written from my dog Chewie's perspective. So that's all to say that self-help parodies are, in my opinion, objectively hilarious. Throughout the book, Miranda gives the reader advice about various areas of life, including romance, life skills, money, and more. But since the book is parody, her advice is objectively terrible. Terrible, and it's all written from the perspective of Miranda, who as a character lacks all self-awareness in a similar way to a character like Michael Scott, but someone who also has this very huge and very undeserved ego. She's self-centered, she's ego-driven, and that is why her stupid advice is obviously going to be the opposite of what we should actually do. With all of that said, I want to break this into two parts. First, the humor I liked with a discussion of why I think those pieces of humor worked well, followed by which parts of the books I found creepy and inappropriate. So let's start with the positives before we get into the criticisms, which is where the really weird and disturbing shit is. Here's what I found funny. First, the table of contents. It says the page numbers, but it also says table of contents now. Like I said, I'm very simple in my humor. I like that it says table of contents now. It fits in well with the book parodying structures of books in general. And something about it reminded me of the book adaptations of the Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff comics, like the Andrew Hussey web comic that exists inside the Homestuck universe. I never got into Homestuck, but I loved Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff. Table of contents contents now just seems like the type of joke that would be made in that book, but much like these books, that was also not for kids. On this page we have wedding vows. She says, it's important to write your own vows because traditional vows have promises you won't be able to keep. I wrote some for you to use. I, Miranda, take you, Bay, to be my husband. I promise to be the best person in this relationship. For I'm better, you're worse. I'm richer, you're poorer, you're sick, I'm in health as long as you shall live. Amen. <laughs> I found this page funny too. She's parodying the typical wedding vows, she's rewriting them, but actually just rephrasing them to be about how great she is. It's 
in character for her and it's a funny play on the typical wedding vows. This page she has advice for breaking up where she'll say, YouTube video, great way to make more views. I enjoyed this joke. I thought it was a funny commentary on the way we can't stop consuming drama on the internet as well as being in character for Miranda whose goal is always attention at all costs. She has a page called Singing. It says singing is a talent that sounds like talking but with more singing. Singing is my number one talent so I'm the best person to teach you about it. In the next few pages I will teach you how to be a great singer. So this is just like the table of contents joke. I love these really dumb circular jokes. Singing sounds like talking but with more singing. The lack of actual advice is the joke and I find it funny. She has this page learning music. Learning music is important because you need to learn how to learn music. Some people will give you music that looks like this. That makes no sense so just use a piano. Then she labels the piano lowest note you can sing chopsticks and high note I can hit but you probably can't. And then she says if you don't have a piano just pretend. <laughs> this page exposes Miranda as a character and her lack of self-awareness when it comes to her own musical skill. Especially the line where she says if you don't have a piano just pretend. <laughs> the joke is that Miranda is teaching us music but she actually knows nothing about it herself all while pretending to be the world's greatest musician. Honestly these types of jokes were what made me really enjoy that free voice lesson video back in 2008. I wish the entire book had just been this type of humor. I think that would have been fantastic. She then has this page called getting fired where it says like tip one never get fired. Tip two quit before they fire you. Tip three if they tell you you are fired don't listen. And then she has this page called set realistic expectations where she says if you have high dreams and goals you probably won't ever achieve them and you will get depressed. So here is a list of realistic expectations you should have. Breathe, look here, watch TV, eat, potty, sit, read this book, close your eyes, open them, have some juice, go over there, walk, drink the cereal, milk, don't move, draw a dot, nod, wear clothes sometimes. So this part feels like a legit self-help book parody. On this channel I've reviewed tons of bad actual self-help books before. Legitimate self-help books not parodies. When we reviewed books like Girl Wash Your Face or You Are a Badass or The 10x Rule, what do all these books have in common? The hustle culture. They're all about setting bigger goals for yourself, reaching higher, holding yourself to higher and higher standards. And that's why this particular page works well in a self-help book parody. It teaches us the opposite, that we should set our expectations lower, that we should expect nothing of ourselves, that we don't need to do any self-improvement, we just need to be our lazy, useless, sack of shit, meat sack selves. She then has this page where there is a math worksheet. I thought this showed a lot of the random style humor that I was talking about earlier. As someone who grew up ravenously consuming the random humor, I found problem number two on this page hilarious. A red train leaves Kansas at four o'clock, a blue train leave Boston at five. When the trains crash, what color will they be? A purple, B green, C fire. <laughs> the joke sounds like something you'd hear on like Homestar Runner or in a strong bad email or something, so I liked it. Finally, I thought the back cover of this book was quite funny. It has quotes, this is the best book of all time, me. Miranda Sings is a genius, my mom. I will pray for you, my pastor. I've never heard of you, girl I met. Why do you do that face all the time, Jerry Seinfeld. We have another genuine parody here. This plays on the quotes and blurbs that books often get from other authors, but instead of giving genuine positive reviews or actual praise or recommendations, it's a parody of that. However, the Jerry Seinfeld thing at the end is a bit sus, and we're gonna talk about Jerry Seinfeld and Colleen's friendship with him more when we get into her second book, so put a pin in Jerry Seinfeld for a second. Those pages of the book comprise everything I liked about self-health. Now we're going to move into my criticisms of the book, what I found creepy and inappropriate. She has a page called First Date. So her first date suggestions include movies. The nice thing about movies, it's quiet, so a great place to talk and get to know each other. And she has uncle's house, very private where you can play with your daddy saddle. We'll, we'll talk about it. Then she has conversation topics. Yourself, how many kids do you want? How much money do you have? What diseases run in your family? Types of yarn? Do you mind genital warts? So we'll start with the genital warts thing. That's an STD. I'm not sure a lot of Colleen's audience, which is mostly middle school and younger at this point, would they know what STDs are? That That's just gross. Unlike the adult humor in Shrek or Animaniacs, there is no piece of the joke here that the kids would actually understand. The joke itself is just the fact that it's gross and sexual. Next we gotta get into the creepy uncle business, okay? Throughout Colleen's books, videos, and other performances, a running joke that she has is about her weird uncle Jim. The joke is that weird uncle Jim is very obviously doing non-consensual physical things to Miranda, but Miranda is too wrapped up in her own ego and instead just lets uncle Jim do whatever he wants because he gives her attention and wants to help her get famous. It's very, very dark humor and it's definitely not appropriate for kids. What I found weird is how much Colleen uses the weird uncle joke as a stand-in for a joke about kids being groomed and abused when in her own ukulele video as a way to say she wasn't grooming kids she called herself a weird aunt. Many years ago I used to message my fans. It's kind of like uh, when you go to like a family gathering you know and 
as a weird aunt. Colleen, in, in what way does calling yourself a weird aunt make you not creepy when half of your jokes in Miranda Sings are about a weird uncle who is objectively creepy? That, that was the entire point. It's weird, especially in light of just how many weird uncle jokes are in these books. Then she has this page, how to be your own doctor. Make drugs at home. Tic Tacs look like pills. Spoonful of pudding or soup is kind of like cough syrup. Popsicle stick. How to fix a sickness. Cold, blanket, broken arm, tape cast, runny nose, tampons, throwing up, stay outside. Stepped on Lego, no hope. Headache, band-aid. Something stuck in you, get help from uncle. A few of these are, are legitimately funny. People have had issues with the tampon thing. I think tampons up a nose to stop a bloody nose is funny. I think that's funny. The stepped on a Lego, no hope. That one's hilarious. What I have an issue here is something stuck inside you, get help from uncle. Ew. Then she has this English worksheet and she has fill in the blanks and the one that we're gonna look at here is tickles are to uncle as blank is to bay and that is slaps, kisses, and strokes. That's just weird and unsettling. There's no piece of like legitimate humor for kids to latch onto there. The only joke is haha the uncle is abusing his niece sexually. Moving on from the uncle thing for just a moment, she has this page called face makeups where she gives bad makeup advice. She says foundation this is like face paint. Girls use a lot of it to hide zits and to look oranger. Blunch. Put this on your cheeks to look more girl. Lipstick doubles as blunch. So she's like obviously doing a bad job looking like a clown. And then she has bronzer. This makes you look like another race. This is illegal. Don't use it. At first I had some mixed feelings on this page. It seemed like the joke here is once again that Miranda is so self-centered that she forgets she isn't the center of the universe. When she says this makes you look like another race, she's implying that the reader's obviously white. Otherwise, how would darker skin make them look other? I think the attempt at the joke here is to say that Miranda obviously assumes the reader is white because Miranda's white, meaning through her self-centered worldview, she assumes the reader is exactly like her in the same way she assumes the reader also has a creepy uncle or also wants to be a singer. But as we've talked about before on this channel, particularly when we've analyzed Stephen Crowder's humor and how it doesn't work, racial humor doesn't work when you're actually racist. It's why Stephen Crowder doing a racist impression of Obama is offensive, but the exact same joke on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia will actually land because the joke comes from the context, from what's being laughed at. Are we making fun of various racial demographics or are we making fun of racism itself? Colleen has apologized in the past for videos she's made playing on Latina stereotypes where she and her sister like drew these obnoxious eyebrows and put on fake accents. The video has resurfaced of my sister and I from 14 years ago. Uh, we are teenagers and in this video we are doing characters that are Latina and the characters are completely based on racial stereotypes. It is not funny and it is completely hurtful. I am so ashamed and embarrassed that I ever thought this was okay. I was a sheltered teenager who was stupid and ignorant and clearly extremely culturally insensitive. Racial stereotypes are not funny. They are not a joke and they should never be joked about. A few years later we realized how stupid and hurtful the video was and we deleted it. Not out of fear of getting caught but out of fear that someone would find it and it would hurt them because it's wrong. But recently a new clip has resurfaced where former fans have condemned Colleen for allegedly performing potentially in blackface. As the Daily News reports, Colleen Ballinger, better known on YouTube as Miranda Sings, is facing new backlash after an old video resurfaced showing what some believe to be Ballinger in blackface while singing a Beyonce hit. While some online are arguing the paint on her face was actually green following a performance as Elphaba from Wicked, the development only adds to recent allegations of grooming behavior where she's been accused of inappropriate behavior with young fans. The video now in question, which is currently up on her YouTube channel, shows Ballinger with dark makeup on her face as she performs the song Single Ladies. The emergence of this video also coincides with recent accusations of racism leveled against Ballinger in a different context. Text messages allegedly distributed to someone involved with her 2016 Netflix show Haters Back Off suggest that she made derogatory remarks about a black actor during auditions. According to the text, she allegedly commented, where is he? Referring to the actor's darker complexion in poor lighting. So is it possible that Colleen intended to be Elphaba from Wicked with green face paint? I mean, I can't read her mind. I wasn't at the show. I don't know her true intentions. I don't have any more information than you do. What I do know is putting darker paint on your face to perform a song that's usually performed by a black woman, that's weird. And it's sus to say the very least. I'm a white bitch, so I can't say what is or what isn't racially offensive. That's not my call to make. However, I've also seen black creators like Paige Christie, who are also covering Colleen's scandals, speak up and say that they found this performance to be racially insensitive. So in light of Colleen's history with racism in her content, I'm not sure a joke about bronzer quite lands in this book. From there, the book only continues to get more sexual and more inappropriate. She has this page where it says porn really big. There are lots of different kinds of porn. The picture below shows a few examples. Lots of skins, Satan juice, tukey, chesticle crack, creases, other. Now the joke here is Miranda, whose backstory includes being raised in a very religious environment, views everything even remotely suggested 
suggestive as porn even when it's not. The joke is meant to play on religious indoctrination and purity culture and how ridiculous that can look when we take it too far. Yes, that is a great joke for adults. I'm not sure kids are quite ready to understand satire that's that complex, nor should they just be reading the word porn in huge letters on the page. I will admit though, the phrase chesticle crack made me laugh. Like I've said, I'm a very simple woman, you guys. She has this page about how to get money where she says, find and couch, get a rich bay, ask mom and sell stuff. She says, ask mom. If she says no, find her purse and take it anyway. This page once again calls into question who the book's target audience is. Every time I wanted to give Colleen the benefit of the doubt and assume that she truly believed that teens and adults were the ones reading her books, a page like this would come along and verify that she knew her audience was young. Stealing money from your mom's purse is not only bad advice for kids, the joke itself really only works for kids. I mean, I guess teens can steal from their parents' wallets too, but when I read this page, I was like, who is this book for? Next, we're going to get into one of the worst parts of this book, which is also a common issue in her second book, and that is jokes about animal abuse. Now, I have personally never really found animal abuse jokes to be funny, even when I was a super edgy teen back in the 2000s. I will say that jokes adjacent to these were considered funny in the public consciousness back then. Like, one of my favorite t-shirts at Hot Topic had a picture of a dog eating its own poop with a caption that said, recycle. My mom wouldn't let me buy it. <laughs> there was also this common t-shirt joke that you would see at Hot Topic and Spencer Gifts and places like that that said, it's all fun and games until someone loses an eyeball and then, hey, free eyeball. Those types of gross and borderline violent jokes were very popular back then. And let's not forget, I'm sorry to have to remind you all of this, let's not forget the, the dead baby jokes trend. That one's good that it ended. But if you went to high school in the 2000s, there is a very strong possibility that you heard at least like five kids in the cafeteria telling new dead baby jokes pretty much every day. But again, this book came out in 2015, long after people realized that those jokes could be very hurtful. And once again, even when that type of cruel humor was popular 15 years ago, it was never meant for children. Anyway, back to the original point, I have never been a fan of animal abuse humor personally. And when we get into Colleen's second book, we'll delve into the animal abuse more deeply because that book has a lot of it. But this is where we get the first hint of animal abuse in her first book, where we have this page divided into two columns, people you can trust and people you can't trust trust. Of course, top of the list of people you can trust is your uncle because we know canonically Miranda has been groomed by her weird uncle, but when Colleen calls herself a weird aunt, that means she's not grooming. It's kind of like when you go to like a family gathering, there's a weird aunt there. But that was me. That makes perfect sense. However, lower on the list, we see that she has animals under people you can trust, but with an arrow to the other column where she says, unless they are alive, and then under people you can't trust, she has animals, parentheses, living. Miranda as a character abusing animals, murdering animals, and and playing with dead animal carcasses is a common motif throughout these books. And I honestly just find that sickening. And again, to be clear, I know that the point of these books is that Miranda is an unlikable character and that we're supposed to laugh at her because of how gross, annoying, and even downright evil she can be. But in some ways, isn't Miranda also supposed to be at least a little bit charming? There's supposed to be something that makes us smile when we watch her, even if it's an ironic sort of enjoyment or taking pleasure in the cringe. It taking pleasure in the schadenfreude of it all. I think jokes about animal abuse kind of take it out of that realm and bring it into straight up disgusting. Again, I'm not the joke police, but I don't personally think that animal abuse jokes are appropriate for kids. And since we've established that younger audiences are reading these books, I do worry that kids will come across jokes like this and feel scared or hurt or sad. Yeah, it is up to the parents, but this is my review and I think it's gross. Warning in advance for when we get into the second book, the animal abuse jokes are much worse, okay? Let's move on to the next page where Miranda uses a racial slur. I'm not gonna say it out loud, but you can see it on the screen. It's all, there on the page. Even in the context of parody, this doesn't work. Colleen isn't parodying the concept of racial slurs, as we pointed out earlier. Racist humor doesn't really work for Colleen because her humor isn't a critique of racism. It's playing into those racial stereotypes. I'm not sure why Simon & Schuster published a book for young readers that has slurs in it, but uh, all right. The next page is titled, Try Some of These Free Activities. And again, it's more proof that Colleen knew very young readers would buy this book, mainly because because of the watch TV example where she says, doesn't cost anything and you can turn it up loud enough so you can't hear your mom telling you what to do. So is Colleen's audience teens who are old enough to understand this very dark humor and this very grim irony? Or is her audience made up of kids who think turning up the TV to tune out my mom is funny? This page is about how to use social media. And I think this section could have had so much potential. Again, if the jokes weren't inappropriate for her target fan base. I think the idea of a self-help book by a social media influencer 
influence or giving you very obviously bad advice to make fun of social media, that, that can be funny. When Miranda shows you how to tweet, she often uses hashtags that are unrelated to the tweet she's showing, like, if at first you don't succeed, then give up, you're not good at it, hashtag follow, hashtag global warming. I found this particular tweet funny, first because she's subverting our expectation of a common motivational phrase, and second because the hashtags are so unrelated to what she's talking about that it hits on that random type of humor we were talking about earlier. The rest of the page should have been like this. Instead, we get things like, I love a sturdy croc. The hashtag blessed after it is kind of funny, but why is she talking about sturdy croc? What? That's just, what? Same thing with I ruined my panties, which is either supposed to be a period joke or like a female sexual arousal joke, or maybe both. Either way, it's a vagina joke. She includes a page of hate mail toward the end where she makes it look like she's printed out and taped some of the worst comments she's received to the page. I like this collage art style of the book. I like the layout. I like the overall like DIY look of it. I don't like the language on this page, which includes multiple uses of ableist slurs plus the uh, the R word, the one that means doing physical things to someone without their consent. I don't think I can even say it in a YouTube video and stay monetized, yet she has it right there on the page. I just don't think we need that explicit of a word in a book that kids are reading, especially as a joke. I'm not sure kids should be reading essay jokes at all, especially not ones with explicit language like that. Then she has a chapter called How to Do Children. I know the title is supposed to mean like how to take care of children or how to raise children, but it's phrased that way because Miranda is a lazy writer and doesn't realize how she comes across. But in light of a lot of the grooming allegations that Colleen has received, which we'll talk about later, I'm not sure how to do children was the best title for this. In this section, we get another animal abuse joke. Whether it's depression or bad marriage, babies are a great way to fix things, but you can't just have a baby. You have to make sure you're ready. Start with a goldfish. After eight days, when the goldfish dies, get a hamster. After the hamster dies, upgrade to a cat. After the cat dies, get a dog. But it doesn't originally say the cat dies. She crosses out, you kill the cat. And then it says, after the dog dies, you are ready to have a baby. Just more animal abuse. Then she has a page about holding your baby, where Miranda is holding a baby in very obviously silly positions. I'm imagining that this is Colleen's actual child in this book, but I don't really see why we needed to hold real kids or why real kids just like needed to be in these pictures at all. Similarly, this next page, fun activities, includes real kids as well. I think the first joke here was kind of funny, where she said, hide and seek, have your kid hide and then do something else while they are distracted. That's kind of funny. But the rest of these are really weird, especially the one where she puts the kid on a leash and has him crawl on the ground, where she says, playing dress up, you can have them dress as a dog or a homeless, and then playing horsey, this looks fun, right? Again, why is she using photos of a real kid? Why not have a drawing, a poorly drawn picture that Miranda made herself could have actually been funny here, and we also didn't need the or a homeless joke. So overall, I thought a lot of the humor in Selp Health had a lot of potential, and I do really love parodies of self-help books. However, I think there were a lot of jokes that were just terrible for Colleen's target audience, and some of it was straight up rule without much of an actual punchline. Her second book, My Diary, was very similar in this regard. First though, I'm gonna be honest, okay? I actually like the title of this book. It's called My Diary, but it's spelled like diarrhea. It's meant to be gross. Sometimes I like poop jokes, you guys. I think gross out humor is funny. I always have, so I thought the title was hilarious. Poop jokes and puns together. What more could I want? Similar to my discussion of self health, I'll be reviewing my diary much in the same way. First, we'll go over the places where I found this book to be genuinely funny, talk about why it worked, break down where it had potential, and then we're going to delve into the places where this book was disturbing, inappropriate, and potentially harmful to a young audience. Not potentially, it was. It, it's gross. So, first, things I liked. She has this page, a uh, dedication page. I would like to dedicate this book to myself because I'm the only person who is allowed to read it. I'm serious. If you are reading this and you are not me, stop it right now. I will make you regret it so hard. Thank you. Once again, this page at the beginning is a genuine example of parody. This book is structured like a diary of Miranda's in which she combines a bunch of books from throughout her life, her childhood baby book, worksheets she did in school, a prayer book from church, a private teen journal where she writes about her love life and romantic misadventures, until ultimately we see Miranda's rise to fame as a social media music star. The dedication page of this book does a a decent job of parodying a diary. Obviously the dedication is going to be to herself because Miranda is self-centered and also because canonically the book isn't intended to be read by anyone else. I thought that worked. Next we see a photo album of Miranda as a child, which in the context of the book were photos taken by her mom, but in real life I believe these are photoshopped pictures of Colleen as a child and she photoshopped her face to make herself look angrier and more evil. On this page we get some holiday memories. Uh, the last picture actually made me laugh out loud. It says a fun Easter performance. Miranda is about to cruise 
crucify herself. So cute. <laughs> that actually made me laugh out loud, I'm not gonna lie. Would a young kid get the humor of playing on religious institutions that permeates this book? Maybe not, but I thought it was funny. Then we see Miranda's schoolwork that her mom gives her after she gets homeschooled. The humor here comes from the fact that Miranda was an awful student, but her mom went too easy on her, which explains why she is the way she is. So it says, my sweet Miranda, today I think we need to work on something called manners. Please finish each sentence with something kind. Love, mommy. Example, may I please have a hug? Now you try. And she wrote, please stop talking. Excuse me, you smell like a fart. Thank you for literally nothing. I'm sorry you're so annoying. I love me. In this context, Miranda is supposed to be the evil child herself, so it is plausible that these sections of the book could be enjoyed by an older reader who wants to laugh at how silly Miranda was as a child. I thought this page was kind of funny. I didn't see anything wrong. She has this page that says, Dear Diary, I'm having a horrible day. First, my mom told me to get out of bed when I wasn't even ready, and then my stupid Barbie was staring at me. Don't worry, I got her back, but I'm sick of being disrespected. P.S. I didn't even have any eye crusties this morning. Total ripoff. Love, Miranda. I really liked that line. I'm sick of being disrespected. I don't know why the thought of an angry little evil child feeling disrespected because a Barbie wouldn't stop staring at her. That's just funny to me. I have a weird sense of humor. But we also see Miranda becoming disgusting since she believes that not having eye crusties when she wakes up is a ripoff. I thought this was adjacent to the gross out humor, but without taking it too far. There was nothing sexual, nothing violent, just a genuine joke about how badly she wanted to have gunk in her eyes. So why not? So this next page gets into like borderline sexual humor, but I think it does it in a funny way that doesn't actually cross the line. So it says, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. I said a bad word on accident. I hired my BFF Patrick to be my assistant, but then I realized there's a bad word in his job title. I was tricked into saying it. Forgive me. It turns out there's a lot of words that trick people to cuss, so I changed the names to help people stop sinning. I honestly thought this page was one of the funniest recurring jokes in the book. Miranda doesn't like to swear because she's a good religious girl, but the joke is that she's still extremely rude and she still comes up with crude language while narrowly avoiding using actual swear words. I think this is legitimately funny for readers of all ages because kids love the whole getting away with almost swearing thing. The joke here is that Miranda doesn't want to say assistant because it has the word ass in it. To said to herself, she says fanny assistant, which she then repeats throughout the book. My favorite was when she wanted to say grass, but can't say ass, so instead she calls it grebooty. <laughs> oh, and Titanic has the word tit in it, so instead she calls it booby tanic. Like, this is just legitimately funny to me. This stupid humor that made me laugh. These jokes were my favorite types of jokes throughout the book, and I wish we had more of this rather than the really awful stuff we're going to get into later. Finally, we get to Miranda's love life. The joke here is that Miranda meets a boy at church named Michael who doesn't even seem to know she exists or have any interest in her, but because they hold hands during a prayer, she assumes that makes him her boyfriend now. She says, Dear Diary, my relationship with Michael is going really good. Every day this week, I went to his house when he was at school to get to know him better. I've learned that he likes the Spice Girls, Cheetos, and the Oregon Trail. I got on his computer yesterday and tried to win it for him as a surprise, but I accidentally died of dysentery. He must know I'm coming every day because he leaves the window unlocked for me. He's so thoughtful. I gave him this letter at church on Sunday and he opened it and gave it back and walked away. I literally left him speechless. I love him so much. I can't wait till we are married. The Oregon Trail joke, like how she made him die of dysentery, that one got me. I laughed at that, I'm not gonna lie. So those were all the parts of the books that I found funny. The rest of this book is jam-packed with extremely disturbing content. So let's delve into all the parts of the book that were inappropriate. First up, Jerry Seinfeld. Honestly, Jerry Seinfeld deserves to be canceled more than Colleen Ballinger does, but Colleen is good friends with Jerry Seinfeld and she mentions him a lot in this book since she has collaborated with him as a comedian. She says, Dear Diary, today something weird happened. A guy named Jerry called me and asked me to get coffee with him. I never heard of him before, but someone told me he was a comedian, so I thought I would try to help him get famous because I love charity work. We drove around in his weird little car for a while, got some coffee, and he ate some gross diner food. I tried really hard to help him with his career, but I think he just doesn't have what it takes. Bless him for trying, though. Anyway, I'm starving, so gotta go. Bye. Quick disclaimer. Yes, I am a big fan of the show Seinfeld. I identify as a Kramer, although the actor who played Kramer also turned out to be a terrible person. I think Seinfeld is a truly hilarious show, one of the best of its time, the perfect precursor to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia for the genre of watching awful people ruin their own lives while they make funny jokes. But Jerry Seinfeld himself is an awful person in real life, and because of that, I do not support Jerry Seinfeld as a person. Colleen, if you want to put rumors of you grooming kids to rest, hanging out with Jerry Seinfeld is probably not the way to do it. In October of 2019, the Mary Sue published an article called Why is Jerry Seinfeld Cancel Proof Despite Dating a Teen When He Was Nearly 40? Yep. The article explains that when Jerry Seinfeld was in his late 30s, I think 38 years old, he met a 17-year-old girl in Central Park. As the article says, they claimed to the press that they were just friends until she turned 18 and graduated, at which time they went public with 
with their romantic relationship. They dated for four years, and she transferred from her private New York college, where she remained living with her parents, to UCLA in order to be closer to Seinfeld while he was filming his show. They broke up shortly after she graduated from college. I'm sorry, Jerry Seinfeld. Did you say that your defense was that you waited until she was 18 to do anything with her? What do we call that? What do we call it when an adult befriends a child, makes the child trust them, and then counts down until they reach legal adulthood and immediately swoops in for the more than friends part? What do we call that? We call that grooming! That is the textbook definition of sexual grooming. Jerry Seinfeld is objectively a groomer, and I can't forgive that. The article continues. Their relationship caused a bit of a stir, but not in the ways it would today. People Magazine made them their cover story in their March 1994 issue, but instead of it being centered around the fact that when they started dating, she was underage, it was about how the unlikely couple makes their relationship work. I'm glad to see current celebrities like Colleen Ballinger getting called out and publicly condemned when they take advantage of minors, but I hate that people who did this stuff in the 90s or earlier somehow just get a pass for it. That's all to say, I'm not sure I'd promote Jerry Seinfeld in a book whose audience is primarily made up of minors. Speaking of this book being inappropriate for minors, let's delve into the next big issue, the overwhelmingly graphic and sexual humor. She says, Dear Diary, I've decided to put my career on hold. Obviously I want to be famous, but I have too many emotions right now and I can't handle the stress of fame and try to deal with becoming a woman. Stop pressuring me. I wrote some poetry on my napkins at the taco place and I think they really show my feelings good. Roses are red, violets are blue. I hate everyone. Dear everyone, go away. Love, Miranda. I never get anything I want. There is blood coming from my front. I really don't like anyone. That includes your son. No one cares about me. It's annoying when I have to pee in the middle of the night. Life is totally unfair. I like steak medium rare. My mommy is the dumbest. At least I have bubblegum ist. Now this page overall wasn't that bad. The fake poem she wrote was kind of funny, especially roses are red, violets are blue. I hate everyone. It's kind of an anti-joke. I liked it. What I don't like is how throughout this book, Miranda insists on spelling of the word coming in that way. She's always got to spell it like that. And she knows what she's doing. Also, there is blood coming from my front. It's a period joke, which I don't really have a problem with. Periods are just bodily waste. It's no worse than like a poop joke or a pee or a fart joke or anything like that. But the issue is that she's specifically calling attention to her vagina here and juxtaposed with spelling the word coming like that. I, d I don't like it. On this page titled London, Miranda talks about going on tour and performing on stages throughout the world. And when she's in London, she hangs out with a group of shirtless men. Because one of Miranda's running bits is calling everything porn and saying everything is sinful, she uh, censored these half-naked men by writing porn over each of their faces. The joke is that she's censoring their faces rather than their naked chest. This would be funny if this were a joke for adults. The humor comes from the subversion of the expectation. We expect their bodies to be censored, but it's their faces, the least suggestive part of them. However, seeing the word porn written seven times in a row in a book for child readers, that's weird. That's just weird, right? For this next page, we are going to play a little game called Reverse the Genders. When Miranda shows an example of fan art, most of her art will include a uh, camel toe, for lack of a better word. It shows her pants being like tucked up into her vagina with like a vagina wedgie. The joke is that Miranda dresses that way. She pulls her pants up too high, gives her a vagina wedgie, and it's weird. But to regularly show this in visual images, this is where I have to say, let's imagine that we reverse the sexes here. What if Miranda was a male character instead, and all the art renderings of her had like this big sagging dick and balls outline. Would Simon and Schuster publish that? I mean, maybe they would. They did release The Straight Girl's Guide to Sleeping with Chicks. Regardless, the majority of us would see that on a man and say, ew, that's not appropriate. Why is it okay when it's on a woman? The answer is, it's not okay. Then she has this page that takes us behind the scenes of the costume design for her Netflix show called Haters Back Off. And despite what Colleen has told us about Miranda's show being PG-13, I checked on Netflix and no, Haters Back Off is rated PG. It is not rated PG-13. So why do we have a lick my taco joke? Finally, it is time to get to the recurring constant animal abuse jokes. Like I've mentioned many times throughout this video, humor exists within context. A joke that relies on an understanding that animal abuse is bad is very different than a joke where animal abuse is the punchline itself. And it's especially different when we learn about Colleen's history with animal abuse herself. I grabbed my dog for no reason, just grabbed the dog and pinched its skin and dug my nails into it. The dog yelps, turns around to protect itself and bites me in the face. And I got stitches and went to the hospital and they were like, what happened? And I was like, the dog just 
bit me. And then they had to put the dog to sleep because the dog was dangerous to be around. So I murdered a dog. Now, Colleen has since clarified a couple things. First, she claims that she was three years old when this happened. Is that when I was three years old, I was bit by a dog. I needed to go to the hospital. And when my mom told the doctor that a dog had bit me, the doctor said that legally the dog needed to be put down. Now, the clip of me that is circulating from seven years ago is me talking about this situation in a very insensitive way. I don't know how trustworthy she is, but let's say for the sake of the argument that she was actually three years old. Three-year-olds don't have that much control over themselves. I'm not going to hold something that someone did at age three against them or over their head for the rest of their lives. But if we're going to evolve into better people, that means we need to have more empathy at 30 years old than we had at three years old. In this clip, Colleen is disgustingly flippant about the whole thing, making it into a joke that her dog died because of her. Colleen has since come out saying that she used humor as a coping mechanism here, that in real life the dog's death did actually affect her emotionally and that she was devastated as a child when this happened and carried the guilt with her throughout her life. When in reality, when our dog was put down, I was really upset and over the years I have addressed this a few times in videos talking about how guilty I feel, how upset I am that this happened. Still to this day as a 33 year old woman, I feel guilty that our dog had to be put down for biting me. But in this clip, I talk about the story in a very dramatic, silly way because sometimes, unfortunately, I use humor to talk about things that are actually extremely painful for me. And to an extent, I can understand using humor as a coping mechanism to cope with your own trauma. But what I can't understand is putting this out there on the internet like it's no big deal. Sure, let's give her the benefit of the doubt and say for the sake of the argument that she was genuinely hurting and that she had been plagued by guilt for her entire life about this incident. In what way is it appropriate to make a joke about that for your YouTube audience? Keep in mind, most of Colleen's audience is young. And also keep in mind, she's not even in character here. This isn't Miranda telling the story. This is Colleen telling a true story about herself. There is no Miranda character that lacks self-awareness. There is no joke about Miranda's just evil, that's the whole point. Colleen is saying this as herself. She's telling a true story. Her audience is watching that, especially if they're young and impressionable. They see Colleen setting the example that animal abuse and animal death is something to be joked about, something that's not that big of a deal. Animals, especially dogs, have always been a huge part of my life. And I don't think it's funny to joke about hurting and abusing them, especially when you're not even playing the character that we're supposed to hate. What the fuck was Colleen thinking making this video? So with that, piece of the backstory, the animal abuse in these books is even more disturbing. Sure, Miranda jokes about animal abuse because she's evil and self-centered and lacks all empathy, but so does Colleen. So what does that say about her? So on this page she says, this snake was dumb. He wouldn't stay on my neck like a necklace, so I set him free by flushing him down the toilet. Then she says, I finally got a pet that I loved. He was my BFF, Charlie the Fly. I don't know who's bunny that is, I hate animals, gross. The joke on this page is that her pet was actually the fly on her leg in the picture, not the bunny she's holding, and that she flushed the snake down the toilet. Cool. So we we have this page where we learn Miranda had to be kicked out of public school and homeschooled because she flushed the class hamster down the toilet. It says, I regret to inform you that we can no longer have Miranda in our first grade classroom. She has continued to be quite problematic and I'm afraid we are not qualified to deal with a child with this many behavioral issues. We assumed you would discipline your daughter after we informed you that she accidentally flushed the class hamster down the toilet. And then later down on the page she says, okay, Mrs. Zealot is a liar. Flushing that hamster was not an accident. So we're just murdering pets now. Here's some more examples. My sweet Miranda. Today we're learning about adjectives. An adjective is a word that describes something. Example, Miranda is beautiful. Now you try. Miranda is me. Miranda is me. Miranda is me. Miranda is choking a cat. All right. Dear diary, I found a dead bird today. I took its feathers to play with. It was fun. P.S. I put the bird body under mom's bed to play with later. Then we get to this joke about microwaving a pet hamster where it says it's showing her like uh, hater comments and it says she looks like the type of girl who would microwave her pet hamster. These pieces are just really honestly disturbing to me and I find find it weird that she's saying these things jokes or not. Overall, these books show that the core audience of Miranda Sings, the original parody of a snooty college theater major, that audience really got lost somewhere along the way. And this leads into a discussion about the most important part of branding, defining our target audiences. If you don't know who your ideal customer is, you're not going to appeal to anyone, or maybe you'll just appeal to the wrong people. In Stephen King's book on writing, he refers to this as having an ideal reader. When we're writing a book, or creating any product or piece of media, we need to first imagine who is going to consume this. Who do we intend to like this piece of content? What background knowledge does the audience already have about the situation? What life experience does our audience bring in? All of these questions are going to guide what information you choose to put into your content and what information you leave out. It will determine what words you use in your writing, what jokes you put into a video, how you use lighting and visuals and sound effects to appeal to a crowd. So who is Colleen's target audience? She can say that Miranda sings is for teens and up, all that she wants. But that doesn't change the fact that she knows a lot of her audience is younger.
bigger than that. Target audiences don't happen by accident. Entrepreneurs spend tons of time on market research trying to figure out how to reach the customers that they know need the product most. There is no way that Colleen became as successful, as wealthy, and as famous as she did without knowing how to appeal to the audience she had. Yes, it is possible that she originally intended for Miranda to be a character for teens and young adults, but ended up with kids in the audience instead. In fact, I think that's highly likely. But as she grew her platform, as she built Miranda into a huge multi-million dollar brand, she knew. She knew who was watching her. She knew they were kids. Not diddle kids, it's no good diddling kids. Just to be clear, I have never had sex with a child, just to be clear. I wouldn't do it with anybody younger than my daughter. Hell no, little kids gotta be big, holding them away from my daughter, something like that. Don't write a song about that. No. She was literally in DMs talking to children about SEX. She was a 30-something-year-old woman sending imagery to a minor. I was 14 years old and she was sending me Trisha Paytas's naked body, whether it was videos or pictures. She just responds with a, a nude of me and says, you look so pretty in this. How many people has she done this to? This is really weird. It wasn't just one occasion. There was multiple times that she sent just different photos and different positions of me. I was 14 years old, she was in her 30s. Back in 2020, when Adam McIntyre, who was then 17, released his first video calling out Colleen for her behavior, one of the main points of his video included Colleen sending him a bra and panties in the mail. He showed them on camera and explained that Colleen had first offered to send him these when he was 13 years old. And whenever I was hugging her, she said, I'm so sorry I didn't bring your lingerie. Yeah, because uh, in her live stream, she said she wanted to send me her lingerie. I'm not lying, she did. Um, trust me, she hugged me and we were talking and she was like, I'm so sorry I didn't bring your lingerie. Um, my parents were right behind me, so thanks for that, Colleen. Colleen's response video clarified from her perspective that she was just doing a weird item giveaway and that she didn't mean anything sexual with this prize. Rather, she just thought it would be funny. The biggest issue that came from his video is that I sent a child underwear and Wow. Anyone who heard this out of context and was offended, I completely understand because I would be too. In this live stream, I did a giveaway. I was giving away clothes that were unused, tag still on, brand new, that I had just bought that I did not want. One of the items that was in this box was a really ugly pair of underwear. You want the bra? Everyone wants the bra. At the end of the live stream, I was done giving away clothes, and then this boy who made this video about me recently, he asked for the underwear. <laughs> he said, um, hi, you have ugly clothes, but I want those ratchet panties and bra signed by Corey because he modeled them well. Yeah! <laughs> I've always given out weird random things in live streams. I've given out a taco costume, I've given out old body pins, dirty shoes. Uh, a few weeks ago I sent a fan like a single piece of toilet paper. I've always given away weird stuff and so in my mind at the time this was no different than all the other weird stuff I send to my fans as a joke. Now in hindsight I see how completely stupid of me I should have never sent that. But from here more allegations of grooming began to surface about Colleen. Screenshots of group chats she'd had with fans, many of them minors, appeared online showing texts she'd sent to minors asking them questions about sex positions, periods and sexual experience. Colleen Ballinger, the 31 year old, comments and goes, Adam, you need questions for your Q&A? Are you a virgin? To a 14, 15 year old. And then furthermore, it goes on and says, what's your favorite sexual position? There was even an instance of Colleen asking Adam for pictures of his butt. In the group chat, at this time, this was 2016, I think I was 14, 14 ish. I write, my ass looks good today, y'all. Colleen comes into the chat after not responding to anything else and goes, pics, Adam, for me to send pics of my ass. She made minors wildly uncomfortable. Those minors felt violated by her questions and her requests. It doesn't matter whether or not Colleen internally had any sexual feelings toward minors or whether she had any intentions to do anything physically to them. She still made them uncomfortable by sending them sexual messages and from there, it only got worse. On July 3rd, 2023, the Huffington Post released an article called YouTuber accused of grooming teens also sent nude photos of fellow star accuser 
website. The article reports, Colleen Ballinger, a children's YouTube star accused by several of her longtime fans of grooming them when they were teens, is facing new allegations this week after she sent her fans nude photos and videos of another influencer without the woman's consent. Two of Ballinger's fans, who told HuffPost last month that Ballinger fostered inappropriate and emotionally abusive relationships with them when they were as young as 13 years old, claimed on Twitter Monday that Ballinger had sent them lewd texts when one of them was a minor. The texts allegedly included nude photos and videos of Trisha Paytas, another YouTuber. One accuser posted screenshots of the alleged messages. Revenge porn, the act of posting someone's intimate photos online without their consent, is illegal in California where Ballinger is based. There was no immediate confirmation Monday that Ballinger had violated the law or that she was under criminal investigation. On Monday, one of Ballinger's former fans, Johnny Silvestri, 27, posted several text exchanges that he said were from Ballinger, dating to when Silvestri was 22. Adam McIntyre, who was a fan of Ballinger when he was a minor, corroborated Silvestri's claims on Twitter and said Ballinger also sent him nude photos of Paytas. The pictures show Paytas posing in various states of undress in photos and videos originating from other social media platforms. Paytas has been a sex worker for several years and sometimes charges for nude photos of herself on her own website and on OnlyFans. In her video Monday, Paytas said the nude images were behind a paywall on her sites where users had to be 18 years old to view them. Ballinger, she said, had sent explicit material to fans, including one minor without Paytas' consent or knowledge. Let's play our favorite game once again! Imagine we swap the genders. Pretend for a moment that Colleen is an adult man, and that at 30 years old, an adult man had been in a group chat with multiple teenage boys and girls. Now imagine that this 30-year-old man had sent another man's dick pics to a 14-year-old girl. We would be demanding that this person be declared legally a sex offender. That is not safe behavior, and it's just as dangerous when the predator is a woman. I think it's disgusting that the word groomer in public social media discourse has been so watered down and diluted that it barely represents its original meaning anymore. I've had older conservative men show up in my comment section to call me a groomer or say that I support child abuse solely because I've stated that I think it's okay for kids to learn about LGBTQ history and that LGBTQ people exist or to treat same gender relationships equally as valid as different gender relationships. So many people are so obsessed with trying to figure out who's after our kids that they miss the people with the biggest signs right in front of them. Because a groomer doesn't have to be a creepy uncle, nor is a groomer almost ever a gay teacher or a trans woman just trying to use the bathroom. But you know who is a groomer, allegedly? Colleen Ballinger, a conventionally attractive heterosexual cisgender woman, a married mother of three young children, an entertainer who just sings goofy songs and wears goofy costumes. And while we're at it, let's just change the public perception of Jerry Seinfeld too, I'm so done with that. Colleen's original performances of Miranda way back in 2008 seemed real enough to make Miranda seem like a real person, before she became obnoxious enough to be a very obvious character. But the weirdest part of all of this is, that character was just Colleen all along. Miranda sings the inappropriate, disgusting, egotistical musical theater kid. She was real this entire time. Think about it. Getting a dog killed and then laughing about it in a YouTube video. Who would do that? Miranda or Colleen? Both. Or how about sending underwear to a child without any self-awareness of how creepy that is? Would Miranda or Colleen do that? Both. And finally, who would try to deflect rumors of abuse and exploitation of children by singing her heart out with a ukulele solo? Who would do that? Miranda's self-absorbed, pretentious ass sure would, but you know what? Colleen actually did. In the true literary sense of irony, a dramatic irony that Colleen's supposedly satirical books couldn't quite reach on their own, Miranda somehow became more real the more ridiculous she got. We thought that Miranda was becoming more of a surrealist character, but that was the true Colleen Ballinger. Let me know your thoughts on all of this in the comments below. I appreciate you guys watching this video with me. I will see you guys again next week for more videos. In the meantime, please remember to keep supporting small businesses, keep supporting independent authors, and don't support people who abuse children. Bye!